Welcome back, everyone, for another documentary by the Talt Foundation. This time we're uh, diving into a topic that you guys have been asking for a while now. A really interesting one, for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. The Numidian Kingdom. Yeah. And at the center of it all is a guy named Jugurtha. Oh, yeah, he's a uh, fascinating. I mean, a prince who basically predicted the fall of Rome. Like, how crazy is that? Yeah, incredible story. And he even has this quote about Rome from, uh, from Sallust, you know. A city for sale and doomed to speedy destruction if it finds a purchaser. Chilling stuff. Yeah. I mean, he really saw right through them, didn't he? Especially after serving with their troops in Spain. Oh, totally. Like, can you imagine that? Seeing Rome's military might up close, but also seeing, you know, the, the corruption, the, the cracks in the system. Yeah, that must have been a real eye-opener for him. And it really shaped his actions later on. Okay, so before we get too deep into Jugurtha's story, we need to set the stage a little bit. Like, what even was Numidia? Where did it come from? Luckily, we've got some great sources for this deep dive. We're relying on ancient texts uh -huh. and archaeological finds. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what we know comes from their rivals. Oh, you mean like the Greeks and Romans? Yeah. So you can imagine it's like trying to put together a puzzle, but with some pieces missing. And maybe some of the pieces are, you know, bent or, or a little bit uh, distorted. Exactly. We have to be careful with those biases. Right. But that makes it even more interesting, right? Trying to uncover the real story. Absolutely. Oh, it's a challenge. So, today's mission is to unravel those mysteries of the Numidian kingdom. And we're talking about a kingdom that wasn't just, you know, surviving. They were a power player. Oh, yeah. I mean, did you know there was a time when Carthage? That's right. Paid taxes to Numidia? They did. There's this legend about King Hyarvis. Oh, I've heard that name. He was an early Numidian ruler. And the story goes that he basically made Carthage pay up. For what? Like protection money? Y you could say that. It was a condition for letting the Phoenicians, the ones who founded Carthage, settle in North Africa. So, wait, Carthage, this massive maritime power was paying rent to the Numidians. That's crazy. It really shows you how influential Numidia was. Even before we get to those detailed historical records, Yeah. it suggests they had a long history. That we're only just starting to uncover. Exactly. Okay, this is getting me hooked. Let's move to the 3rd century BC. That's where some big names start popping up, right? Yeah. So who are the main characters during this time? You've got King Gaia, King Alamus, and then there's King Syphax. Syphax. I feel like I've heard that name somewhere before. He was a major player. Mm -hmm. His kingdom stretched from modern-day Morocco into Algeria. Wow, that's a huge chunk of North Africa. Wasn't he known for being a pretty savvy political operator? He was. His reign was all about shifting alliances. And power struggles. Exactly. There were a lot of those in North Africa back then. He had to play the game to stay in power. So who was he aligning with? Rome? Carthage? Both, actually. He played them off against each other during the Punic Wars. Oh, wow. Talk about playing with fire. It must have been tough for the everyday Numidians, all these shifting borders. It was. They'd be caught in the middle of these power plays. Their allegiance is constantly changing. Okay, so now I want to focus on Western Numidia, specifically the Massilian Kingdom. What made them so powerful? Well, they had a prime location. What do you mean? Fertile land. Perfect for farming and raising livestock. And those vast steppes bordering the Sahara, right? Exactly. Perfect for raising those powerful armies, especially their cavalry. Oh, yeah. Those Numidian horsemen were legendary. The best. Fast, maneuverable. Imagine swarms of them harassing their enemies. Hit-and-run tactics. So how did King Syphax, Mr. Shifting Alliances, keep control of this powerful kingdom during the Punic Wars? Like we said, he was a master at playing both sides, never blindly loyal to Rome or Carthage. Always looking out for number one. He even married Sophonisba. Who's that? She was the daughter of a Carthaginian general. It was a strategic move, you know, to solidify that alliance. A high stakes game for sure. Did it pay off? Not in the long run. He ended up defeated and his son Vomina took over. Oh, so what happened? Did the kingdom fall apart? Not immediately. Vermina ruled for a bit, but then the Massilians, their rivals from the east, they took over, absorbed most of the Western Kingdom. Okay, so now we're talking about Eastern Numidia, the Massilians. This is where we get to Messinissa, right? That's right. The Massilian kings, they were big players before and after the fall of Carthage. Their story's really woven into that whole saga. Absolutely. Okay, so fill me in. What made this kingdom tick? Well, we have to go back to King Alimus, possibly the first Massilian king. Okay. And then his son, the famous Messinissa. 
the guy who ruled for over 50 years. Yeah, Masinesa, the king who lived to be over 90. That's incredible. He was a force of nature. So what was the kingdom like that he inherited from his dad? I think eastern Algeria, western Tunisia, a region rich in resources. Right. Mountains, forests, fertile plains. They had everything. They built up a strong agricultural base, raised tons of livestock. And a powerful military, I bet. Of course. Yeah. And we have evidence. There's this incredible structure called the Medrasan tomb. I've never heard of that. It's this massive circular mausoleum. Historians think it belonged to this dynasty. It dates back to the late 4th, early 3rd centuries BC. Wow, so even back then they had the resources for these massive building projects. It shows their power and their influence. Okay, now let's get to Messinissa. This guy is a legend. What made him such a key player? He was a brilliant strategist, for one. Uh -huh. And a charismatic leader. He knew how to make alliances. Yeah. Like with who? His biggest one was with Rome. Ah, so he saw which way the wind was blowing. You could say that. <laughs> he used Roman power to his advantage, especially during the Second Punic War. He was instrumental in helping Rome defeat Carthage. Which basically paved the way for him to unify Numidia, right? Exactly. The largest, most powerful Numidian kingdom ever. But he wasn't just a conqueror. He was a builder, too. He focused on internal development, building projects, promoting a more settled lifestyle even cultural advancements. So a true visionary, not just about military power, but the well-being of his people. Absolutely. Okay, so now we've got this unified kingdom stretching from the Maluya River all the way to the Serte. What happens when Masinissa dies after 50 years on the throne? Does everything just fall apart? Well, Masinissa may be learning from past mistakes. He planned his succession. Oh. He divided his kingdom between his sons, Makipsa, Gulusa, and Mastanibal. So, like a three-way split, did that work? Did they play nice? There was some power sharing at first. Pekipsa was in charge of admin and justice. Galisa had the military. And Mustanibal Bile. His role was a bit less clear. But eventually, Mekipsa consolidated his power, ruled for 30 years. And surprisingly... What? He was peaceful, stable. He kept his father's focus on development, building cities. Numidia really prospered. It wasn't all war and conquest then. They knew how to build and create, too. Absolutely. Cities like Dugga, Bolaregia, the Vests, they all grew significantly. Yeah. And their capital, Serta, mm -hmm. became a major commercial hub. Big merchants, traders from all over the Mediterranean. Wow. All this while Rome was expanding. Seems like Mekipsa was walking a tightrope. He was, but he never neglected the military. He knew Numidia's independence depended on it. So he had a strong army ready to go. Oh, yeah. 10,000 horsemen, plus a sizable infantry, but even the best laid plans, they can go wrong. And that's where Jugurtha comes in. That's right. After Mekipsa died, a Salgation crisis hit. And that's when Jugurtha enters the picture. Okay, now things are about to get interesting. Jugurtha was ruthless. He was ambitious. Oh, he was. A real product of his time. Numidia was fighting to stay independent, remember. And Jugurtha, he represented that struggle. All right, so let's dive into this next chapter and see how Jugurtha's actions changed everything for the Numidian kingdom. Let's do it. Jugurtha's story, it's a classic case of power and ambition gone wrong. He was a product of his time, though. You know, Numidia was struggling to hold on to its independence. With Rome breathing down their necks. Exactly, and Jugurtha, he embodied that struggle. Okay, so how did this ambitious guy end up right in the middle of a succession crisis? Wasn't he part of the royal family? He was Mekipsa's nephew. Yeah. And Mekipsa... Maybe thinking he was doing the right thing. He named Jugurtha as co-heir with his two sons. Oh, so Adderbal and Hamsel? Yeah, so you've got three guys all wanting the throne. A recipe for disaster. For sure. And Jugurtha, he wasn't into sharing power. I bet not. He thought he was the rightful heir. The one who could bring Numidia back to its glory days. You know, he saw Mekipsa's sons as weak. Not fit to rule. Exactly. And this belief that he was destined for greatness... It led him down a pretty dark path. It led him to murder, didn't it? It did the rivalry between Jugurtha and his cousins. It escalated quickly. Yeah. He tripped Hamsel, the younger brother, lured him into a trap and had him assassinated. Wow. So Adderbal, what did he do? He was terrified. Yeah. He fled to Rome to ask for their help. The classic go to the Romans move. We've seen it before. Kingdoms trying to survive. They turn to Rome for protection. This is a common tactic. Yeah. So how did Rome respond? Did they help Adderbal? At first, they tried to be the peacemakers. You know, they wanted to avoid a full-blown war. Makes sense. They sent a commission to Numidia to split the kingdom between Jugurtha and Adderbal, hoping to keep everyone happy. But I'm guessing Jugurtha wasn't the compromising type. You're right. He saw it as weakness. 
a chance to grab what he thought was rightfully his. He attacked Adderbal's forces completely by surprise. Yeah. Laid siege to him in Serta's scream, captured him and had him executed. That was a direct challenge to Rome, wasn't it? They couldn't just ignore that. It was a huge miscalculation by Jugurtha. He forced Rome's hand. They couldn't just stand by after they'd promised to protect Adderbal, plus public opinion in Rome was turning against Jugurtha. So this is what sparks the Jugurthine War. It lasted seven years, right? A brutal war. Rome wanted to crush Jugurtha, but he didn't go down easily. Not at all. He was a brilliant guerrilla leader. He knew the Numidian terrain inside out, and he used that knowledge to his advantage. Give me some examples. Ambushing Roman legions. Yeah. Exploiting their weaknesses. He even bribed Roman officials to slow them down. It sounds a little like what Hannibal did against the Romans in the Second Punic War. You're right. To see the similarities, Jugurtha, like Hannibal, knew that facing the Roman legions head-on was suicide. He had to be smart, adaptable, and willing to use unconventional tactics. So he was a brilliant military mind. Definitely. But this war, it wasn't just about military strategy. What do you mean? The Jugurthine War. It exposed the corruption in the Roman Senate. How so? Jugurtha's bribes, they reached the highest levels of Roman power. Oh yeah, it was a scandal. Public trust was shattered. Political tensions in Rome were rising. So this conflict in North Africa, it was causing shockwaves across the Mediterranean. Definitely. It destabilized the Roman Republic even further. Well, what happened? What was the final outcome of this war? Did Jugurtha manage to hold off the Romans? He fought hard. He had some early victories. Hmm. But Rome was determined they wouldn't give up. They never do. And in 105 BC, after years of bloody fighting, Jugurtha was betrayed by his own father-in-law. Who was that? King Bacchus of Saif of Mauritania. Wow, that's cold. He handed Jugurtha over to the Romans. What did the Romans do to him? They weren't known for being merciful. Oh. They paraded him through the streets of Rome in chains during one of their triumphal processions. Oh, humiliating. A public spectacle. Then they threw him into the Tullianum. The Tullianum. A notorious Roman prison. He died there of starvation. A sad ending for a king who, even though he was ruthless and made some bad choices, he fought hard for his vision of Numidia. A tragic figure for sure. So what happens to the Numidian kingdom now? Does Rome just take over completely? It's not that simple. Rome didn't immediately annex all of Numidia, but the Jugurthine War, it weakened them badly. And it gave Rome an excuse to interfere whenever they wanted. Exactly the beginning of the end for Numidian independence. A slow slide into Roman control. Pretty much. Rome put Gata Jugurtha's half-brother on the throne, but only in the east. And Bacchus III of Mauritania, remember him, he got a big chunk of western Numidia as a reward for betraying Jugurtha. So that unified kingdom Massinissa had worked so hard to create, it was broken up. Fragmented, vulnerable. Divide and conquer the Roman playbook. It worked every time. And for Numidia, it was the beginning of the end. There were more internal conflicts, and Numidian kings, they got sucked into Roman civil wars. Which further eroded their independence. Exactly. So who were the last Numidian kings? The ones who saw the final curtain fall on their kingdom? King Hemsel II was one. And then his son. Juba. Yeah. Ambitious guy. Yeah. Made some bad choices. Juba. I, he sided with Pompey against Julius Caesar, right? During that whole Roman civil war mess. A risky move. A fateful one. It sealed Numidia's fate. It did. So tell me about Juba. What kind of leader was he? Was he another Masinissa or more of a reckless gambler? He was ambitious, tried to expand his territory, got into fights with the Romans and the Mauritanians. He wanted to restore Numidia to his former glory. So he saw the Roman Civil War as a chance to grab some power. Maybe to play the Romans off against each other and yeah. come out on top. But he underestimated Caesar. Big mistake. What happened? The Battle of Thapsus in 46 BC. Ah, uh, yes, a turning point. Juba, I fought alongside the Pompeians, but Caesar crushed them. It was the decisive victory for Caesar and the end for Juba. What happened to him? He took his own life rather than be captured. Wow, so that's it, the end of the Numidian kingdom. It's a sad story. A kingdom that lasted for centuries brought down by ambition, betrayal, and bad choices. It's a classic tale. But even though the kingdom was gone, the Numidian people, they didn't just disappear. What happened to them under Roman rule? Did they hold on to their culture? Did they resist? These are the questions we'll explore next. It's fascinating how the Numidian people adapted to Roman rule. We talked about that cultural blend, Numidians rising in Roman society, and even some pockets of resistance. It seems their story didn't end with the kingdom, but just took a new turn. Yeah, a new chapter. 
It seems like the Roman conquest didn't just wipe out Numidian culture. They found a way to coexist. Exactly. Roman rule didn't erase their identity. It was more like a give and take. Yeah. You know, a cultural exchange. And the Romans, they were smart about it. They weren't out to destroy everything. More like incorporate what worked for them. Right. They were pragmatic rulers. They knew that trying to force everyone to completely abandon their traditions would backfire. So Roman law, administration, the military, all that came in. But a lot of Numidian life, especially out in the countryside, it carried on. So this mix of cultures, it must have made for a really unique society. What about those Numidian cities we talked about, Sertaduga? Did they survive under Roman rule? They did. More than survived, they thrived. The Romans integrated them into their economic system. They built roads, improved trade routes, and their populations grew. Roman settlers and traders came in, brought new ideas and technologies with them. So like melting pots almost, Roman and Numidian cultures mixing together. Did the Romans do much building in those cities? I mean, we know they loved their grand architecture. Oh, they did. The Romans couldn't resist a good building project. They poured money into infrastructure, public buildings, temples, bathhouses. They even built amphitheaters. Wow, imagine those Roman structures next to the older Numidian buildings. What a sight that must have been, a physical representation of how those two civilizations were merging. Did any Numidians become prominent figures under Roman rule? Actually, yes. Several Numidians rose through the ranks. One example is Lucius Apulius, a yeah. writer and philosopher. I've heard of him. He was born in Medaros, a Numidian city, and he's best known for his novel, The Golden Ass. It gives us a peek into Roman North Africa a blend of Roman and Numidian life. So even though their kingdom was gone, Numidian culture was still alive and kicking. Their stories were still being told. It shows how adaptable people are, how they hold on to their identity, even in the face of huge changes. It's a testament to their resilience. But of course, not everyone was happy under Roman rule. Mm. There were definitely those who longed for the old days of independence, those who resisted Roman authority. So was there any organized resistance to Roman rule, any attempts to revive the Numidian kingdom? There were pockets of resistance, especially from the nomadic tribes. They'd always valued their freedom, and they weren't thrilled with the Romans trying to make them settle down. They rebelled from time to time. It's inspiring in a way, even if they didn't succeed. That spirit of defiance shows how much they valued their independence. It's like the legacy of those Numidian kings, their fighting spirit it lived on. Absolutely. Their resistance shows us how strong that desire for freedom can be, even when the odds are stacked against you. I mean, Jugurtha, he was a brilliant guy, a yep. cunning strategist, a real fighter, mm -hmm. but it just wasn't enough to beat Rome in the end. He came close, though. It makes you wonder, what if? What if he had won? What if Numidia had become this powerful empire? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Like, imagine a North Africa dominated by Numidia, not Rome. How would things have been different? Oh, it's mind-blowing to think about. The whole balance of power in the Mediterranean would have shifted. Trade routes, alliances, everything. It's crazy to think how the ambition of one man could have changed the course of history. Right. And Jugurtha, he wasn't just a military leader. He was also really focused on preserving Numidian culture. Yeah. Resisting Roman influence. Yeah. He wanted Numidia to be its own thing, not just a copy of Rome. Exactly. So maybe under his rule, Numidia would have become this cultural center too. A place of learning and innovation, attracting scholars, artists from all over. Wow. A Numidian renaissance. That's a really cool image. But let's be real here. Even if Jugurtha had won, I doubt Rome would have just let him be. No, they wouldn't have. They were too obsessed with power with expanding their empire. So even in this alternate timeline, a clash between Rome and Numidia seems inevitable. Probably. But maybe it would have been a different kind of conflict, not just a war of conquest, but a long-term struggle for dominance. Yeah, like a constant back and forth each side trying to outmaneuver the other. Exactly. It's amazing to think how different the world might have been if things had gone just a little bit differently for Jugurtha. And as we wrap up our deep dive today, I'm struck by how much there still is to learn about this civilization. That's what makes history so fascinating. It's a constant process of discovery. The more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know. And there are still so many mysteries surrounding the Numidians. Like what? What are the big questions that historians are still trying to answer? Oh, tons of them. We're still trying to understand their early history, their political systems, their social structures, their religious beliefs. We're uncovering new archaeological sites all the time. Yeah. Each one gives us clues, but also raises more questions. It's like we're only just starting to scratch the surface. There's a whole world of knowledge out there waiting to be unearthed. And that's the excitement of it. It's an ongoing journey of discovery. So to our listeners out there, we encourage you to keep exploring the Numidian world. 
Read the accounts left by their rivals, but also look for the voices of the Numidians themselves. Explore the archaeological sites, the artifacts, the inscriptions. Let them tell you their stories. Remember, history isn't just dates and facts. It's about people, their experiences, their triumphs, and their struggles. The Numidian kingdom may be gone, but their story lives on. A story of resilience, of adaptation, of a culture that refused to be silenced. It's been a fascinating journey exploring the rise and fall of the Numidian kingdom. We hope you've enjoyed it and that it's inspired you to keep digging into this amazing period of history. We'll see you next time for another deep dive. Until then, happy exploring.